What's up, everybody, and welcome back into a little one-off episode, an impromptu video with my dad about this Daniel Penny situation that's happening over in New York. If you remember, this story was national news when Daniel Penny put Jordan Neely in a headlock on a subway. Jordan Neely passed, and Daniel Penny, some felt was a hero protecting people's lives on the subway. Others felt was a criminal eventually charged with second-degree manslaughter and or criminal negligence. Well, they did the trial, and the jury's been deadlocked after multiple days of deliberation, and the judge and prosecutors have decided to dismiss one of those charges. And you guys had questions. So we're going to watch some updates, give some background, read a jury instruction, and explain exactly how this is possible. And is this even legal? Will there be appellate issues because of this? How will this affect the future of this case? All that and more on today's video. Let's get into it. So dad, the bat signal was up in the air loud and clear over the last couple of days, right at the end of last week about what's going on in this Daniel Penny case. I haven't watched this trial. I remember when it was on the news. I don't even know if this trial has been streamed. I kind of wish I would have watched it, especially now knowing the jury's deadlocked, because obviously there was some evidence on both sides to consider. Um, but from my perspective, this is a really interesting legal question because we have seen multiple cases with lesser included, multiple charges charging lesser included. Um, in Florida, it's kind of like all coupled into one. We've seen different ways of charging and trying these cases when you have loss of a life and you have either a uh, top kind of charge like murder, if you have manslaughter, if you have criminal negligence, if you have involuntary manslaughter versus voluntary manslaughter. Well, in this case, they charged second degree manslaughter, which carries a potential sentence up to 15 years and or criminal negligence as kind of a lesser included, but also as a count two that carries with it up to four years in prison, one of the lower level felonies in New York. So um, I'm going to play a video here that gives us a little background as to what's going on, and then I'll pick your brain about what you think about how this process has gone. You have something to say first? That, well, yeah, just the charge, criminal negligence, homicide, which makes a difference because it, it was a, a death, right? Not just criminal negligence. So that's usually that's a misdemeanor, point. right? What? Usually criminal negligence is a misdemeanor in most jurisdictions. Right, right. But resulting in death makes it a felony, and it is a felony here. Um, so yes. that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. Let's uh, let's watch this little news clipping here to tell us a little background for anybody that's new to this case. This will give you a little bit of a deeper dive, or I should say a, a quick overview, and tell us kind of what happened in the courtroom. Breaking now, a judge in New York has dismissed one of two charges against Daniel Penny. He is an ex-Marine charged with the 2023 killing of a homeless man named Jordan Neely on a subway in New York. Let's go straight out to our courts and legal reporter, Zach Schoenfeld. Zach, what's going to happen now? Yeah, Drew, quite a striking development here on the fourth day of jury deliberations in this trial of Daniel Penny. And it all ended with now the top charge in this case, that being second degree manslaughter, being dropped. Uh, it all began earlier today when the jury on its fourth day of deliberations came back with a note to the judge and the parties indicating that they had reached an impasse on this charge and could not reach a unanimous verdict. What the judge did next is he gave them what's called an Allen charge, which is an instruction to the jury that essentially encourages them to keep trying, to be flexible, to try to reach that unanimous verdict one way or another, but to not give up uh, and settle on them being at an impasse. They then went back to their deliberations. So before we get to that, let's let's break down kind of what's going on one by one. So they try the case. The jury is told about both charges in the beginning. They're given instructions about both charges in the beginning. They hear evidence about both charges and they go to deliberate. And when they deliberate, you start at the top charge and then you work your way down. That's how it is supposed to be done, right? You don't skip around. You don't jump around. So that's right. why we're hearing the jury is deadlocked specifically on the second degree manslaughter, which is the top charge that the prosecutors who this is going to be important as well, right? Who chooses what to charge in these cases? The prosecutor's office. Who controls that? The prosecutor's office. You can't, as a defense lawyer, as a member of society, or as a judge, force a prosecutor to prosecute a crime or a charge that they don't want to. So it is their decision. 
They choose the highest level to of what to charge. Why don't you talk about that real quick? Just like how prosecutors make the decision on a case like this. What do you charge? Do you try to go for the max? Do you try to go for what you can win? How do you deal with picking what charge? Well, you pick the highest charge you can you think you can convict on, the most serious charge. So that's where you start. Now, New York does it a little bit differently. And Florida, they have the option, but they normally don't do it this way in Florida. There are things called lesser included offenses. And the lesser included offenses are charges that contain almost all the elements of the most serious charge, but maybe one thing is left out. Um, like, uh, you know, you've got um, marijuana charge of, you know, uh, over 30 grams, which is a felony. Well, a lesser included is marijuana under 30 grams, which would be a misdemeanor. So those are lesser included charges. So the jury has to look at the most serious charge first and then move down to the lesser charge if they can't find him guilty on the most serious charge. In New York, they do it a little bit differently. In this case, they did it a little differently. They charged the most serious charge, but instead of saying a lesser included offense, they charged a second count, which is a lesser charge, the criminally negligent homicide. Both are deaths, but that criminally negligent homicide carries a lighter sentence. It carries, like you said, four years as opposed to 15 years as the maximum. However, the, the facts are identical. Almost all the elements are identical. It's the intent that's different. You intend in manslaughter, you have a reckless disregard for life. Criminal negligence means you were negligent and it resulted in a death. So there's a little difference, but basically they're totally intertwined. The facts are totally intertwined. And in this case, the most serious, the manslaughter, then you've got the criminal negligent homicide as your lesser included offense. Yeah, and it's, I mean, this is really interesting because this this really goes into law and definitions and what's so important and how you instruct the jury. Does a jury understand what you're you know, trying to explain to them? Because your marijuana analogy is kind of simple. If you think the guy, the defendant, possessed the marijuana, then you have to figure out how much. Was it over however many grams or under however many grams? And that's how you make your decision. If you don't think he possessed marijuana at all, it's an easy not guilty no matter how many grams are being charged. And that's an interesting analogy to what we're going to get to in this case. But before we do, an Allen charge. Let's talk about an Allen charge real quick because after multiple days of deliberating, they are um, at an impasse on the higher charge. We've seen lots of trials have this kind of result at first, unfortunately later because, um, or, or I should say lately, because it means there's really not enough evidence to convict, to convince all of these jury, jurors to convict. And that's never a good thing when you give an Allen charge and then they come back guilty. You wonder why, especially in the land of the free here where it's supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt. You got to be sure to convict somebody and put them away for this long. Um, quickly, what, what's an Allen charge? What's the point of it when a judge gives an Allen charge to a jury? Allen charges are very common. They're given in, in every jurisdiction that I know of. And basically what it tells the jurors are, look, we spent a lot of money trying this case, a lot of time, a lot of effort. So, you know, let's not waste that money. Go back there and come back with a verdict. I mean, not it can be a not guilty verdict. It can be a guilty verdict. But come back with a decision so that we don't have to try this case again. And basically it tells them, go over the evidence again. Talk about it, discuss it, keep an open mind and see if you can reach a unanimous decision. So it, it, it gives them some neutral instructions, but you're really telling them, come on, we've worked really hard. There's got to be a verdict one way or the other so we don't have to try this case again. And so the judge does that in this case. That was the last thing this reporter said. So we're going to bring the reporter back out here and listen to what happened after the judge gave the Allen charge, meaning go back there on manslaughter, right? The highest um, charge, go back there on manslaughter, try to come to a unanimous verdict. That is your job. That's why you're here. There's no other jury that's going to be more qualified than you. But to not give up uh, and settle on them being at an impasse. They then went back to their deliberation room, kept talking. They sent another note asking a technical question about the charge a little later. And then it ended later in the afternoon with. So he mentions a note they send back with a question about a technical question. We're going to get to that in a later clip that I'm going to show because they actually put the jury questions on there. So I'm going to hold on discussing that and, and let him finish explaining. Yet another note indicating that after all of this, after four days, they still could not reach a unanimous decision on this charge. 
Then the parties started battling over what should happen next and what the appropriate remedy should be. The defense here, Penny's lawyers, argued at this point there needed to be a mistrial and that anything else would be coercing the jury into reaching an unfair decision. They lost that argument. Instead, the judge went with prosecutor's proposal. They proposed dropping this top charge of second degree manslaughter and instead going to the second and final count, a lesser charge of criminally negligent homicide. So they still have a chance of salvaging this trial and reaching the guilty verdict that they want, but certainly prosecutors here suffering a big loss with getting their top charge dismissed. All right, so let's talk about this for a second now. So they, they come back deadlocked even after an Allen charge and the prosecutor's like, we have an idea. Let's get rid of this second degree manslaughter and just go forward on criminally negligent homicide. The defense is like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, this should be a mistrial. They came back after the Allen charge. We saw in Karen Reed's case, we've seen it in many cases where the jury comes back multiple times deadlocked. They're not going to come to a verdict. It should be a mistrial. So they kind of argue back and forth. Prosecutors say we want to dismiss the charge. Judge, en judge ends up throwing it out. How does a judge make a decision like this? Well, you know, I, I want to go back for a minute to your prior question about pro prosecutors and charging decisions. Mm -hmm. The prosecutors, I think, deliberately charged it this way. I think they deliberately charged it this way, hoping that if they can't get a guilty on the more serious ones, the jury will compromise and give them a, a guilty verdict on the lesser charge, so thinking that, you know, they've done everybody a favor. They've split the baby, so to speak. So that's why they charged it this way. Now, the state, unfortunately, saying to themselves, look, we can't even get them to agree on the more serious one. And they would have to agree either guilty or not guilty on the more serious charge before they can move on to the lesser charge. They can't even get that. So uh, what they do, and they have every right to do it, uh, most every state has the same rule, prosecutors have the charging decision right they can make a decision to drop a charge or to go forward with a charge. In this case, they told the judge, judge, if we dismiss this charge, would you send this case back to the jury based on the criminal neglig criminally negligent homicide? And the judge told them, yes. Now, both sides argued this, and the judge and everybody admitted there is no case law, there's no rule in New York that takes uh, into account this situation so the judge had to make a decision on what he thought it was right. If I could, let me tell you what I think the judge was thinking. The judge's side was, I can send this case back to the jury with both charges if I wanted to and tell them a third time to go back there and deliberate. So what difference is it if I send them back there with two charges or I send it back with one? I still have the right to send it back with the one and the prosecutor has a right to dismiss the most serious charge. So I'm not really breaking any rules. The defense, I can tell you, has a totally different view uh, of the case. But that's what the judge was thinking. And the judge then said, OK, I agree with the prosecutors. Prosecutors, you have a right to drop it. Fine, drop it. I have a right to send it back. I'm going to send it back for the jury so, to do a third time. So before we get to what the defense is thinking in their argument, thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Now, we all know that there are tons of companies that store your information and all you need is for one of them to get hacked and then your information is compromised. I didn't even know you could request for some of them to remove your data. And it's a bit daunting when you think about all the different places that might be storing your data. But guess what? Incogni makes it easy. You can create an account and put in whose information you want them to go and remove. And you may be shocked at how many requests they send out where your information is currently being stored. When I click the button and watched Incogni go to work, I didn't even know most of the websites that were storing my data, which means I wouldn't have even known to go and ask them to remove it. It's not often you can go back and correct an issue like this, but that's exactly what Incogni does. So if you want to check it out, we've got a deal for you. 60% off their annual price with the code lawyer, you know. So thank you to Incogni for sponsoring this video and making this code available at incogni.com slash lawyer, you know, code lawyer, you know, all the details are listed in the video description below. From a prosecutor's point of view, and these are things that sometimes we really hate about the criminal justice system is it feels like such an unfair playing field, but it makes sense that you can't force a prosecutor to continue to prosecute this second degree manslaughter charge. If they right. said, you know, if, if let's just say this, we go to trial, we feel like it goes well for us and it's the jury is deliberating and the prosecutors come to us and say, Hey, 
uh, Mr. Tragos, will you take a criminally negligent homicide? Your client can go home five years of probation and will dismiss the manslaughter charge. And you say, yes, they have the right to dismiss that manslaughter charge. You, the judge can't say no, no, no. Well, I mean, theoretically the judge could, could reject the plea deal, but, but the judge isn't going to say, no, you have to keep prosecuting the higher charge. That's just not how the, the justice system works. The prosecutors make these charging decisions and they can change them and they can dismiss them after putting you through hell as a criminal defendant, putting your life on hold, uh, posting in you know social media and in the public, everybody thinking you're a criminal, putting you on trial, putting you through all this stress, then they can dismiss the charges at the end. And most of the time, if you're a defendant, are you really going to argue with it? Because it's or usually better for you if you dismiss the charges. So why here would the defense argue with dismissing that higher charge? Because they've got theories of defense that go to both charges, that if the if the jury can't find him guilty because of their theory of defense on the more serious charge, the manslaughter, then they can't find him guilty on the lesser offense of the criminally negligent homicide. One of those defenses, justification. If he was justified in what he did, and that was an affirmative defense in this case, if the jury finds he was justified in what he did, they cannot find him guilty of either of those charges. And if they're deadlocked on the justification issue, then they're deadlocked on both cases. So therefore, the again, their argument, the judge should have inquired, is your deadlock, don't tell me what your vote is, but is your deadlock the issue of justification? If it is, then it's a mistrial and we come back another day because you can't find him guilty on either one. Another one, and I didn't hear this argued, but another issue is cause of death. The cause of death in this case is was an issue. You had one pathologist saying the cause of death was the choking. He held it too long. You have another pathologist saying that his cause of death was partly schizophrenia, partly synthetic marijuana, and partly sickle cell. And so if the jury is deadlocked on his cause of death, that goes to both counts, not just one. So the judge, they're saying, should have made an inquiry, not sent it back because the deadlock could be on both counts and therefore it should have been a mistrial. And I, I want to play the rest of this clip, but before we do, I am going to instead show what my next plan to show, which was something all of you guys were tagging me on. This was the big question, right? So, so everybody is asking me, how is it possible that this case can continue on the, the second charge, which is the criminally negligent homicide. How is it possible if he's not guilty of manslaughter, obviously he's not guilty of criminally negligent homicide, kind of exactly how you explained it. If they believe he was justified in using deadly force up to the manslaughter, then obviously it's going gonna, it's gonna to handle negligence too. So let's read this jury instruction on manslaughter. Manslaughter in the second degree. If you find the defendant guilty of count one, manslaughter in the second degree, then do not, do not consider and do not render a verdict on count two criminally negligent homicide. That's always how it is, by the way, with lesser included. Next paragraph. If you find the defendant not guilty of count one, manslaughter in the second degree, for the reason that the people have failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not justified. That's what you're talking about. Justified in using deadly force. Then, you must not consider count two, criminally negligent homicide, and you must also find the defendant not guilty of that. So that's your point. The instruction is already, if you're going to find not guilty because the state did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that his force used was not justified, it's over. You don't even consider count two, and you would be correct if that is why we shouldn't send count two back to them. But there's a third paragraph, okay? And, and everybody, a lot of people tagged me in one of these documents that, that had the, the highlight on just paragraph two or the red circle around paragraph two or a star next to paragraph two or even like the other stuff crossed out. So all I could see is paragraph two, but paragraph three is here. If you find the defendant not guilty of count one, manslaughter in the second degree, for some reason other than the lack of justification, then proceed to consider and render a verdict on count two criminally negligent homicide. And you mentioned it off the top. The difference between manslaughter and negligent homicide is your mens rea, your criminal mindset. What were you intending? How were you acting? Was it reckless disregard? Was it an accident? 
That is what they're asking here. If you're trying to get into the defendant's brain and that's what you can't agree on, did he do this act recklessly or did he do it accidentally? And if you can't agree on that and half the room thinks it was an accident, half the room thinks it was reckless, then you're deadlocked on second degree manslaughter. Right. But, but you guess know what? The, go ahead. I was just no, go think, ahead. Guess what? If you work it down, everybody that thought he was reckless is definitely going to convict on, on the negligent homicide. And everybody that thought it was an accident is going to convict on negligent homicide if they don't think the force that he used was justified. So it is possible to get to the criminally negligent homicide, even if you're deadlocked on the second degree manslaughter. What were you going to say? Here's the fear, especially the fear for the defense. They're arguing about count one. There are a couple people that say this, he totally intended, he meant to kill this guy. You know, two or three people say that. So they won't change their mind. So they're deadlocked, regardless of what the other nine people say. But then those three people say, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, we'll come off of saying that, you know, he deliberately killed him here, like the manslaughter that he, he you know, he was reckless disregard for human life, which is manslaughter. If, if you guys go ahead along with us and find him guilty of count two. So let's all agree on count two and we'll come off of count one uh, in order to make everybody happy. That's the fear that they have is that those really strong people uh, that wanted to find him guilty of count one convince the other people that it's okay. They'll come down if to down to count two if they'll come up and find him guilty of count two. Yeah. That's the fear that they have. And honestly, that's normal life. Like you can't blame them for that. That's kind of what people do right. in normal life. We try to compromise. We try to get the job done. I don't think that's what's happening here. Right. I really don't. Oh, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be a compromise verdict. I think there are some people who have dug their heels in. Um, but again, the fear, the, the whole group, the whole 12, I guess the whole 12 did not discuss count two, at least they're not supposed to have discuss count two yet. If count one becomes off the table, that means they can discuss count two. And you may have some different opinions on count two than you had on count one. So they may find him guilty on count two, but they never could talk about count two because they couldn't get over count one. I mean, it, it, it sounds, it sounds like a circle, but you know, that's really what could be happening in there. Something just popped into my head that I wanted to Talk about, I was trying to make a note and I, it already is gone. Um, so, so yes, I, I think there's so many interesting aspects to this. And frankly speaking, with what we know now, after reading that jury instruction and after kind of hearing how you've explained it, do you have any issue with the decision the judge made, the argument the prosecutor made, and the fact that the defense lost this motion? I do. Um, I, I, I do. I think the defense had a really good argument as to why a, a deadlock, just, this should have been a mistrial, because they tried this case based on the way the state charged it. And the state charged it with the most serious charge being that manslaughter. So you know that they concentrated on their defense and they concentrated their closing argument on manslaughter. Now they've, in the middle of trial, they've taken manslaughter out. They've changed your your whole philosophy. Maybe the maybe you would have tried this case differently if all it was was criminally negligent homicide. And so they did that to you right in the middle of trial. Not middle of trial. They did it to you while the jury was deliberating, far past the middle of trial. And I think that it, it, the judge should have done one of two things: granted a mistrial or made an inquiry of the jury, since justification was in the jury instructions. I think it would have been a fair uh, comment for the judge to say, again, don't tell me your vote. Don't tell me what's going on. Just tell me, was justification the issue for the deadlock? And, and I think that would have been a good decision, and that would have been a fair decision. So to play devil's advocate a little bit, at this point, I, I hate that prosecutors can do stuff like this. I absolutely hate it. But you had a case recently where they changed the date range right before trial. You oh, had yeah. done all the depots, asked all the questions, and you're like, what the heck? And they just change the date range because they're allowed to do crap like that. And it's so frustrating and it's so annoying, but they can do stuff like that. So technically, I think at this point, but there's a twist coming. So just wait. 
uh, at this point, I'm like, ugh, okay, I kind of get it. You know, I, I always am one that's like more information is better. Um, technically, they didn't change course, like you said, because they did charge two counts. So it's the defense's call. If they just want to focus on one, they could have focused on two. That's a proper legal argument that, you know, they chose to focus on count one, Judge. They knew count two was there the whole time. I get what you're saying strategy-wise, Dad. Obviously, that's what most defense lawyers do, but that's not really, you know, hiding the ball or changing course, things like that. So I kind of understand their argument at this point. But I want to go back and first listen to the end of this news clip, but the next news clip is going to have the really interesting twist for me. Is there any difference, Zach, in what could be the possible punishment in this negligent homicide charge versus the manslaughter charge that was being previously considered? There is. That top charge of manslaughter that has now been dismissed, that would have carried a maximum of up to 15 years in prison. You compare that to now the second charge that the jury will be considering as their sole count, that can carry a sentence of up to four years in prison. So quite a stark difference. Of course, any final sentencing decision will be up to the judge. Those are just the maximums. Uh, but this is you know, expected to be now a lesser penalty uh, than what would have been on the top charge. But at this point... All right. So that was it on that one. Is there anything you want to say on just the, the potential sentences? No. Okay. All right. Let me pull this video in. All right, here we go. Now, new information, because you got to remember, I didn't watch this trial. You haven't watched this trial. I don't even know if it's streaming. So I didn't know all the details that had come out. But this is this is a very interesting tidbit to add to our discussion. Last hour, a judge has moved to dismiss the top charge in a former Marine subway chokehold trial and is now sending the jury home for the day. Jurors have been struggling to reach a unanimous verdict on the manslaughter charge Daniel Penny was facing. They've been deliberating since Tuesday on whether to convict Penny in the death of Jordan Neely. Now they will come back Monday to decide on the other charge in the trial. Neely, a 30-year-old subway performer, had been struggling with homelessness, mental illness, and drug use. Witnesses say he had gone into a subway car in May of 2023 and began acting erratically. We're going to show you some of the moments that are really at the center of this case. A moment caught on camera that put the case into the national spotlight with people rallying for justice for Neely, others in support of what Penny did. But we want to warn you, you may find this inside the court. I'm going to skip the video. Just we've seen it. I don't want to watch it again, but um, we're going to get get to she's going to report what's going on in the courtroom room now. Uh, how did this all unfold today in the last few hours? It was a very busy day in the courtroom today, uh, Tom, and it started at the very beginning, and that was at the third day of deliberation. Uh, these jurors, some 20 hours of deliberating, now what they did starting at 11 o'clock, they sent a note. Take a look at the full screen of what happened. That note went into the judge. It said, we, the jury, uh, instructions from the judge. He says at this time. All right, so here is the tidbit. I don't know if you know about this, Dad. I did not know about these questions and comments from the jury, and I'm going to read them just so we can talk about them here. She's going to read them in a second too. 11 a.m., they said, we the jury request instructions from Judge Wiley. At this time, we are not able to come to a unanimous decision as to count one manslaughter in the second degree. That's 11 a.m. 12 p.m., one hour later, we the jury request further clarification in the determination of when a person reasonably believes physical force to be necessary. So with that comment from the jury, everything changes for me. To me, this comes, this becomes a very clear situation where they are considering reasonable force, justifiable force. They are considering, and just for clarification for everybody watching, I'm going to pull up the um, jury instruction again because it specifically says if you find not guilty on count one because they failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not justified, then you must not consider count two. And when you define justifiable force to the jury in the jury instructions, this is the exact language that it pulls. A person reasonably believes physical force is necessary. That is right out of the justifiable use of force jury instructions in this case. So knowing that they asked this question, by the way, at 3 p.m., the judge receives another note saying jury still cannot reach unanimous decision. 
So knowing that these questions or comments had come from the jury to the judge, how does that change or actually in your position probably enhance your position that this should have been one of two things, either a mistrial or the judge should, should have further inquired about this justifiable force? Oh, well, you're right. It enhances my position. It justifies my argument. It gives credence to it. It gives credence to the argument of the defense lawyers because they have raised this argument uh, that the judge should have inquired about justification being the reason for the deadlock. And uh, boy, it sure does seem to me like the judge had reason to make that inquiry. And two things. Why not get information, right? And the answer to that, why not get information is you don't want to put an idea in the jury's head. You don't want to push the jury. You don't want to force the jury to feel like um, they have to decide on justifiable, justifiable force or whatever it may be. So I understand that fear, right? You don't want to be the one to bring something up to a jury as a judge in this situation, but you're not. They brought it up to you. It is a very clear issue they're struggling over. So I don't see any prejudice to either side for the judge to ask the simple question you you brought up are you deadlocked on you could even use this on when a person reasonably believes physical force is necessary well what i what i would have done if, if i was a judge i would find that jury instruction uh and i would say uh, is is this and then read it is this the the issue that's deadlocking you uh, because this way they can't complain because it's a jury instruction it was already given to the, the jury, so he could sh use the jury instruction when he asked the question, is this the issue? And I think he should have done that. 100%. I agree 100%. And by the way, the reason, you, the reason he said that for everybody listening is we as lawyers love to use the jury instructions because everybody's already agreed on them. All sides, both lawyers, the judge. So anytime we can use a jury instruction to explain something or clarify something to a jury, that is always the best way to do it because it's language we've all already agreed on. Um, all right, let's keep listening to this. I'm not sure if there was anything else. This was the big piece I wanted to get from this video, but there's two minutes left, so we'll listen to it real quick. Time, we're not able to come to a unanimous decision as to count one manslaughter in the second degree. The judge told him, go back, take a look at this, something they call the Allen charge. Take a fresh look at it and come back. But in less than a, sh a short amount of time, I should say in an hour, they came back again and said, we the jury request further clarification in the determination of when a person reasonably believes physical force to be necessary. They go back and deliberate. They have lunch. And 2.30, the lunch ends 3 o'clock. They come back with another question. And the judge receives another note saying the jury still cannot reach a unanimous decision at that point. With discussion with both the prosecution and the defense attorney, the judge decides that he will dismiss dismiss the second degree manslaughter charge against Penny. And now he's just facing that criminally negligent homicide charge. That's a charge that carries, if convicted, uh, four years in prison versus 15 if he were convicted of the manslaughter. Tom? So, Rahama, what are the chances that this could go to a mistrial as the jury considers this other charge now? There are a lot of people around this courthouse who think that's a real possibility, Tom. These jurors clearly were struggling with the legality of what they were handed in terms of how they would decide this. They could not decide on the more serious offense. Will they be able to decide on this charge of criminally negligent homicide? Again, a lesser charge. We're going to find out on Monday or maybe in the days coming next week whether or not that's possible for them. But for now, it was not something that they were asked to think about. After mm -hmm. a long, exhaustive day today, the judge said essentially, that first charge is over. I'm going to dismiss that charge. I'm also going to adjourn you, the jurors, for the day. Have a good weekend. Don't think about this. Come back on Monday and see if you can get this job done. All right. So first question right off the top there, what she was talking about, how do you expect this to end? Do you expect the hung jury on, on count two? I got to be, I, I, this, I, I don't know. Um, I, there is a really good chance for a hung jury. There are, there are some, there is at least one person on that jury that is really holding out. And, uh, and they, they've already gone back twice. Um, I don't think it's going to come. I think, it, I think hung jury, if I had to pick, I'd pick hung jury. Yeah. That that's, that's where my strong lean is. 
Um, yeah. But I have a couple other follow-up questions before we end. Just there's so much fascinating about this to me. It sounds like she said the way they announced it to the jury is that the judge dismissed the manslaughter charge. Is that is that what it seems like to you? Well, I th that's what she says. I, I, I doubt if the judge worded it that way. How do you um, think he worded it? He probably told them that they no longer need to consider the manslaughter charge and that when they come back for deliberations, they'll only have to consider count two. If I was uh, the defense lawyer, I would have very strongly pounded the table telling the judge the way it should be told to the jury is the state dismissed count one. I, I don't think the judge will do that. Why? Because I think the judge will make it a neutral statement as opposed to, a, I, I, it's not a neutral it's statement. Not when neutral. He blames the son, when he blames the state for it, it's not a neutral statement. But it's I would the, be, the, the judge decision. would be neutral. It's the state's decision. If they want to make that, if they don't want to dismiss that count, then let's keep rolling. If they want to dismiss that count, tell the jury the state dismissed the count. I, that, that's another thing I just think is so unfair. Why can we not just tell the truth to the jury? The state wanted to dismiss the count, so tell the jury the state dismissed the count because you can understand why I'm, I'm heated about this because if you go back and the jury hears, wait a second, the state just took however many weeks pounding the table for second-degree manslaughter that you know we think this is what he did and did something happen? No, I'm trying to see if I can find out what the court said. Actually said? Like, is there yeah. a clip of it? I don't I, No, it's not a clip, but I thought I read a news article uh, yeah, about what the judge up. said. Go ahead. See if you can find it, because this is so unfair. For us to, to, for us to argue and say the defense really doesn't want this, the state really wants it, the judge sides with the state. That's fine. And I understand legally why the judge sides with the state, and we've already beat it like a dead horse, that the state makes these decisions but the jury should know the state made this decision because I do think that would affect how the jury goes back there and deliberates like, whoa, whoa, whoa. After the state's been saying the whole time that they think this is second degree manslaughter, now they pulled it off the state table, definitely shows weakness on the part of the state. From the defense's point of view, um, it's the truth. And this is the only reason we're still here and it hasn't been declared a mistrial and this stuff dismissed. So from my perspective, that's really important. And again, I just think that's an unfair part of our process. If the judge tries to make it like this was his decision um, or that it was a neutral decision that everybody kind of agreed with, because that's not what it was. The judge had to make the ultimate decision. I get that. But just again, there's so much going on here with this. Um, I don't know if this is a quote, Okay, but here is reported from the news agency. Wiley, who's the judge, told the jury the secondary misdemeanor charge has been dismissed and and allowing them to only consider count two. That's so that's, that could be, that's what they're reporting. That could be he dismissed it. That could be the state dismissed it. I would have just just pushed for language that said the state has dismissed count one. Um, okay, a couple incredibly important questions here. Well, this one is a little less important. How do you think the jury uh, reacts to hearing that that's dismissed? What do you think? What do you think it does to their mind, if anything? Um, I think that those jurors who are arguing for not guilty are going to go back there and puff up their chest, and they're going to say, "You see, you know, you know, he wasn't guilty. You know, even the and the jury now, we merit to the jury, the judge is the king, and always is the king. So if that judge says the case is dismissed, I think they're going to think." the judge dismissed the case. And they're going to say, see, the judge dismissed that case. We were right. However, it can, it can go the other way. Well, now we have count two. The judge didn't dismiss count two. So obviously there must be enough evidence for a conviction on count two. So it, it could weigh against the defense when they're considering count two now, when they're saying, yeah, everybody must have agreed count one was no good, but they must have all agreed count two is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I guess that's true. And that's why the truth yeah. would help. Um, okay. The really important questions, the two incredibly important questions. Number one, people are very worried that if this is a hung jury and it's a mistrial and we got to do this all over again, that the state can retry Daniel Penny on the manslaughter charge, but that's not going to happen. Double jeopardy attached and they dismiss it. I didn't hear anybody say with or without prejudice, but there's no way the judge no. would let them dismiss this without prejudice, right? No, I don't think so. No, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't think so. 
So, yeah. so it is dismissed with prejudice. No way they retry him on the second degree manslaughter. Uh, why don't you explain why? Explain what that means, like jeopardy attaching, and why that would just be completely against everything in our criminal justice system. Well, most everybody knows the word double jeopardy. It means you can't be tried twice for the same crime. That means tried. In other words, you can be charged twice, but if you go to trial and they start to actually put on evidence against you, then you're actually being tried for that case. In this case, they actually put on evidence to try to convict him of this charge. That ends it. They dismissed it. Double jeopardy attaches. That's over. Now, I, you know, if you want to really go far afield, it doesn't mean that the federal government couldn't charge him for a civil rights violation for violating that man, for, for violating uh, Mr. Neely's or civil Neely. rights. Yeah. I mean, and we have seen that happen right. with, with police officers Children. in shootings where maybe a jury, the state jury found them not guilty, but the federal government came around and charged them with civil rights violations. So that doesn't mean that couldn't happen. But as far as state court goes, he is safe, double jeopardy, he can't be charged again. Yeah, and um, we've seen it even when they've been guilty on state charges that sometimes federal charges come yes. if it's applicable. Um, okay, next question. If it's a hung jury on the criminally negligent homicide and they mistry the case, do you think they try this case again against Daniel Penny? I would not. Uh, if I, I was the prosecutor making the decision, I would not. Um, I, I think, and they're, they're going to catch a lot of grief for not trying it again. I mean, they probably would, but I wouldn't try it again. I, I, mean, I, I mean, this is New York City. And, you know, and there are a lot of sympathy for what he did. I mean, a lot of public sympathy for what he did. And not just public sympathy for what he did, but um, he's getting sympathy. I mean, Phil Mickelson, the uh, you know, famous golfer, came out and supported him uh, the other day and made a statement. In front. Um, um, uh, Senator McLean from Arizona, uh, his daughter, came out in support of him. Uh, so there's a lot of people on both sides that are coming out in support of this saying that this prosecution really shouldn't have happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I get how we get to these places. Um, but I think especially after not being able to prove a criminally negligent homicide, like that's embarrassing. Like you, like you got to hang it up at that point. In my opinion, I would be shocked if they did retry it. Um, what do you think, let's say it's a guilty verdict on the criminally negligent homicide. Has this situation created appellate issues in your mind? Yes, it absolutely has. And the interesting thing will be also what the sentence is going to be, because the judge has the ability not to send him to prison if he's convicted on this. So I'd be curious to see you know, what the judge is going to do, um, knowing these facts and, and hearing this trial. Um, but yes, this definitely creates an appellate issue. So yeah, I was going to ask about sentencing last, but let's talk appellate issues first. What appellate issues does this uh, bring up in your mind? <coughs> well, um, again, according to the judge and the lawyers, because I've read their stuff, um, this is something new. This is a novel situation. Uh, there is no law uh, that tells the judge what to do in this kind of situation. So some appellate court is going to have to make the decision, is it right for a judge to allow the state to dismiss one count in, at the end of a trial while the jury is deliberating in order to focus them on a second count. Is that right? Is it, should the judge have a responsibility after, again, we have two, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, two times they've come back deadlock, does the judge have a duty at that point to inquire as to what the reason is for the deadlock before he sends it back a third time? Or should the judge have just granted the mistrial right then and it would have been over? Uh, th there are some definite appellate issues, and because it's a novel situation, some appellate court is going to have to write an opinion about it. So judges in the future have some guidance if this comes up again. Yeah, it's it's a new issue, right? At least seemingly it's a new issue right. in New York, and it seems unfair. Um, it seems completely unfair to the defendant, especially with the comments made by the jury and the fact that the judge didn't even inquire. Like, at least that should have happened, in my opinion, although... I will say it's one of those things like it's going to sort itself out theoretically if I'm the state and I'm arguing clearly it wasn't a justification issue they were deadlocked on if they're able to convict him on the criminally negligent homicide because they determined as a jury 
unanimously that this was not justified and in fact was a criminally negligent homicide. And, so that and that's a very, argument. that's a very legitimate, and that's a legitimate appellate argument. They can argue that in their brief to the appellate court that obviously judge justification wasn't the issue. Otherwise they would not have found him guilty because the argument of the defense is inconsistent with the verdict. Because if you have a verdict of guilty, that's inconsistent with justification being a reason. So they've got a very good argument if they come back. And the only way there'd be an appeal is if it came back with a conviction. If it was a not guilty, there'd be no appeal. So no appellate court would have an option to rule on it. Yeah. And, and you know, that that's always the difficult topic. And the, and the state would actually use that same jury instruction uh, in their own argument to say, judge, they were clearly focusing on you know, justifiable force, when you can use that force, when it's necessary. They were clearly focused on that and they couldn't get past it for the first charge, but they were able to on the second charge for whatever reason, right? We can't get into what were the arguments the jurors were making? Was it the right arguments or the wrong arguments? You can't enter the province of the jury. So we're going to have to live with this verdict. It sucks, but I think that's the argument that they're going to make. Um, okay, last question, sentencing. You kind of mentioned it before. The judge knows the jury is deadlocked. He knows this is not a slam dunk. He knows the defense believes this should have been dis, uh, di, uh, uh, mistried. Um, and he knows the state dismissed on their own the highest charge. How do you think this will affect the sentencing? I know you said what you think a judge can do. What do you think this judge will do in this case? I think the only thing that's going to affect the judge's sentencing, he's not going to care about the state dismissing the charges. He's not going to care about the defense argument about justification because they found him guilty. The only thing the judge is going to look at, I think, are the facts of the case and whether or not there needs to be prison time for someone who did what he did under those circumstances. Maybe he's guilty of being criminally negligent, but does he deserve to go to prison or is it enough to send a message to the public? And that's that's very important here in this case is, and, and I think that's what the prosecutors are talking about, is a message to the pro public about being vigilantes on the subway. So the judge can say, do I need to send a message? How much of a message? And does giving him probation send a sufficient message to the public, or do I have to put him in prison? I think the message to the public is going to be a big deal when it comes to sentencing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I definitely think this I would be surprised if the judge went on the higher side if he gets convicted here. I would think this would be about as minimal as you can get, but I don't know. And that's the point is you never really know where things are going to land, but you know, when lives are on the line and in this case, Liberty is on the line and loss of life has already happened. It's very serious. A lot of people looking for justice. A lot of people don't necessarily agree what justice looks like in this case. So I'm, I'm glued to it now. I wasn't watching it before I'm in. This was such an incredible, um, incredibly interesting legal question. So thank you for coming on to discuss it, break it down with me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully your questions were answered because I went through my Twitter slash X and got all of the questions you guys had tons of it. Um, so I think I got through most of them. Let me know if you have more in the comment section, please hit that like button. If you guys haven't already, that's all we got. Oh, and subscribe till next time. We're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.